Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile artist Carl Zachman. But first, joining me now is the founder and director of the Dunn County Writers Group, Jennifer Strange. Jennifer, thanks for joining us today. Well, Thanks for having us here, Mr. Harris. We enjoy everything you do. Well, thank you. Uh, as, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're from, maybe, yeah, these type things. Well, sure. I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We oftentimes call it Fargo South, so I understand that sometimes this is called Sioux Falls North, at least back in the day. And um, after I went to high school and graduated from Washington High School in Sioux Falls, I kind of hit the road and ended up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and, and then moved overseas with a friend of mine uh, for a couple years and lived in Sydney, Australia. And at that point, I really decided that I had the urge to be a travel writer. And so when I came back to the United States, I started at the University of Kansas and earned a journalism degree from the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communication down there at KU, go Jayhawks, and also an English degree and a, a major in women, gender, and sexuality studies there at KU. And then I landed my first journalism job up in Cordova, Alaska. And I moved to that little tiny fishing village that was off the road system and lived there for four years and was the editor of their weekly newspaper, the Cordova Times. And from there, I found my way down to Southern Oregon where I lived for 15 years and started a small uh, marketing company, uh, Jennifer Strange Marketing and Communications and, and uh, really focused on promoting the burgeoning wine regions there in Southern Oregon, as well as sustainable uh, lifestyles, food, and travel there. And then I met my husband, and uh, we got married about nine years ago. And about five years ago, we made our way here to the Bakken oil patch and moved to Kildeer and have been living in Western North Dakota ever since. So what brought you here, though? The oil patch itself? The Well... I kind of call myself a Dakota regrant, not a migrant or an immigrant, but somebody who has returned to their homeland after, in my case, a 30-year absence. And the reason that we came back, John, is not so unusual to hear out in the oil patch, which is 2008 took a beating on our finances and our future plans, and we were looking for a way to reinvent ourselves and rebuild after the Great Recession. And having family here in the Dakotas, of course, helped quite a bit, and we kept an eye on industry and opportunity that was happening in Western North Dakota. And my husband, by this time, had uh, gotten his commercial driver's license as kind of a re-career, uh, uh, an attempt to reinvent himself as well. And we found our way out here and, and uh, he drove a water production tanker there in the oil patch for the first three years or so we were here. And that's kind of what brought us to Western North Dakota. Well, I understand you describe yourself as a fifth generation Missouri river rat. What, what does that mean? Yeah, well, if you live on the Missouri River in South Dakota, the colloquialism amongst neighbors is river rat. You know, we're a bunch of river rats. And my ancestors came from England in the 18, late 16s, late 1860s, early 1870s, and they settled in Sioux City, Iowa, and up into that southeastern area of South Dakota. And they were this, they created a business called the Strange Brothers Furrier Company believe it or not. And so they traded in furs and hides and they traveled all over the Missouri River where they built trading posts and then they would uh, bring them back along the Missouri River to their factory in Sioux City, which had been the first brick building built on the Missouri River north of Kansas City um, in or around 1875 or so. And our family has just always kind of gravitated toward the river and lived on the river. So I'm a fifth generation strange, <laughs> for whatever that's worth, <laughs> and uh, Missouri River rat because that's our family land there on that Missouri River area in southeast South Dakota. Okay. Well, you're the founder and director of the uh, Dunn, Writers, uh, Dunn County Writers Group. Uh, for folks that may not know, where is Dunn County in North Dakota? 
Dunn County is considered Southwest North Dakota, and it's also considered one of the counties on what we here in North Dakota refer to as the Western Edge, or sort of the beginning of the American West, kind of in the very, very far eastern foothills of the of the Rockies, you know. And uh, Dunn County sits north of Stark County, and Stark County is where Dickinson is, so that's probably the nearest big city reference point. And that is about 35 miles south of Kildeer, which is in Dunn County. And Kildeer is where uh, the Dunn County writers kind of got their start. And then seven miles east of Kildeer is a town called Dunn Center, John, which is where the Dunn County Historical Society and Museum sits. And that is where some of us writers met for the very first time in November of 2013, four years ago almost to the month anyway, uh, thanks to a North Dakota Humanities Council writer's workshop that was taking place there at the museum. And that writer's workshop brought North Dakota poet Deborah Marquardt from mm -hmm. Napoleon, south of Bismarck, and Taylor Brorby, who is from Center, North Dakota, uh, to 13 different rural communities in the western part of the states to talk to people about their stories of, of settling, living, moving back to, moving to, for the first time, Western North Dakota. And a small group of people gathered there at the Dunn Center Museum. And that is ultimately, the next year, what turned into Dunn County Writers. Well, and, and there you go. Here's what we're talk about today a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got an event coming up the weekend of October 13th and 14th. Uh, you know, the poetry on the high plains. Tell us about the event, what it's about. Yeah, well, this is our fifth visiting writers series. So when the Dunn County Writers incorporated as a North Dakota nonprofit, we had as our mission to preserve a written legacy of the people of our region and to build community around the cultural arts. And we decided to launch a visiting writer series where we would bring well-known published writers, poets, uh, speakers, um, figures in the media arts to our underserved region for a weekend of reading and writing workshops. And this event that's coming up, Poetry on the High Plains, is our fifth one of these visiting writer series. And we are lucky enough to be featuring two well-published, well-known North Dakota poets, Carol Kapon Richensky, who is a Fargo native. She's right here, and she is a therapist, and she also has a counseling uh, business that she runs out of the Spirit Room right here in, in Fargo, and this is her first book of published poetry. It's called A Beautiful Hell, and she is also currently working on her second book of poetry uh, called Voice Lessons, and she has published a, a novel called Mama Baby. And so she is going to be coming all the way from Fargo to Kildare, and she will be sharing some of her prose poetry from this book and reading some of her works in progress. And then our second author that we're featuring is Mark Trechok, and he's featured right in the inside fold here of this beautiful snowy egret uh, literary journal. And Mark Trechok is a really interesting fellow. He's been living in Western North Dakota for 24 years now. He's a retired Lutheran pastor who then became the executive director of Dakota Resource Council. And then after really retiring from his career, he picked up his poetry pen again. And since he did that, he has had over 50 of his poems published in literary journals all over the United States. And he really focuses on the poetry of geographic place. So Western North Dakota is a focus of his writings, as well as um, some of his extensive travels in Latin America. So both of these two poets we are lucky enough to have coming uh, weekend, next weekend uh, to Kildare. Now, uh, could you have events like this without sponsors and volunteers? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, a lot of these are a lot of these events happen purely because the North Dakota Humanities Council has has been a very generous 
um, grant provider for us. Um, I think that part of that great collaboration came from the fact that they were integral from the very bedrock of Dunn County Writers having, you know, been the sponsor of that first workshop where so many of us came together. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to have events like this in rural North Dakota? Well, as you all know, I know you've traveled extensively in the western part of the state. Uh, you know, we have a lot to offer in the western part of the state, especially when it comes to recreation and industry, uh, resource development, and um, we've got great schools. We've got Dickinson State University out there. Um, but in some of the more rural areas, there isn't much on the cultural arts landscape. And one of the things that our group feel really strongly about is the idea of building bridges and building partnerships with local and regional individuals, businesses, and organizations to really light that cultural arts landscape up a little bit. And what we found over the four years we've been doing this is people are hungry for these events. They're, they're, we don't have a bookstore in the area other than at the university there in Dickinson, but in most of Western North Dakota, there's not even a bookstore. So for us to be able to bring in authors and their books to sell and to have signed is, you know, a real treat and a unique experience for a lot of, of residents. It also brings a lot of people from from outside Western North Dakota to Western North Dakota, which of course promotes local economy and business. Sure. How many people do you expect uh, will attend the event? You know, what we like to say is we, we plan for 150 and we hope for half that. Um, we've been pleasantly surprised several times uh, by, by having a crowd around 100, 120. Um, we hope, you know, for 50 to 100 people to have their interest piqued by this enough that they'll uh, either walk down the street to it if they live nearby or get in the car and, and drive out and, and join us for this. Yeah. C can you tell us about, it, it, reading here, the Poetry of Place, a generative workshop. What's that about? And that's going to happen on Saturday, October the 14th. Yeah. Um, one thing that makes the Dunn County Writers a rather unique writers group is that our focus is really to produce original writing during our meetings and during our events. And that helps us fulfill that part of our mission of preserving a written legacy of the people of our region. So if we don't write our stories, who will? Is kind of one of our tropes or themes uh, that, that kind of lead our projects. And this generative writing workshop that will be led by both of our poets, Carol kapon and Mark Trechak, will focus on the poetry of place. Um, Mark is going to focus on um, helping people tell stories about their own lives or people they know regarding the, the geographic space and place that they live in to help them kind of understand and, and work through questions they might have about their own place in this world. And Carol kapon will focus more on what we're calling kind of the interior space, um, being a psychologist herself, uh, and her work deals with a lot of um, kind of um, emotional narrative. So she's going to be focused on sort of interior place. Mark is going to be focused on, if you will, exterior place. And the three-hour writing workshop for 20 lucky participants uh, will offer um, craft talks from both of these uh, teachers as well as writing exercises and then time to actually write. And then at the end you share your writing and you get to hear what everybody else has written. It's really a magical experience. Yeah. Well, there's only 20 slots available, so how, how can people get tickets if they're interested? Uh, we do have an Eventbrite page at www.poetryofplaceworkshop.eventbrite.com. Poetryofplaceworkshop.eventbrite.com. And I think we've got 11 spots remaining for okay. that. You mentioned uh, uh, grants. Uh, can you tell us about your North Dakota Humanities grant? Sure. Um, for this event, we wrote a grant application um, and we did a mock-up of what has become this flyer that will then become a much fancier poster like we have 
for our earlier events. Um, and we, we included that as part of our grant application, as well as a uh, narrative one-page essay of how we hope to fulfill what the Humanities Council asks us to fulfill, right, as a grantee. And then we submitted that to the team there at the Humanities Council. And my understanding, and I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm not, I don't, I'm not on the Humanities Council board, but I believe the board then looks at the grant applications and determines whether it fits their mission and, uh, you know, what their budgets are. And we were fortunate enough that this go around, they, they felt it important to support this event. Okay. Thanks for asking. Well, yeah. yeah, now let's kind of spin off on, on of course, it's a writer's group, uh, but tell <laughs> us about uh, the booklets. I have three of them in front of me here. Uh, so tell me about these, and, and uh, they're now featured in North Dakota libraries, I understand. Yeah, yeah. The uh, North Dakota State Library has accessioned these three booklets, as has the Dickinson Area Public Library. So if you're viewers are interested they are free to go you know page through them there or check them out and read them on their own time um, we publish a booklet of original writing every year and we are currently about two months away from publishing our fourth uh, which will be called North Dakota Notebook uh, to be released on December 4th and our first was called Winter Whispers and is in three sections holidays past present mm -hmm. and future and our second in 2015 is called A Pen for All Seasons. And that's in four sections, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And then last year's uh, booklet is called Journeys, North Dakota's Badlands and Beyond. And this was in six sections where we looked at the four directions, north, south, east, and west, and inner and outer journeys. So as we mentioned, we really like to generate new work while we're together as writers. So at our monthly meetings, our regular meetings, we work on a section of our booklet each month and generate work toward the completion of these booklets. So the fourth one will be out soon. Uh, can you talk about the importance of uh, sort of building a community around cultural arts? Well, I think that it's really important for individuals, groups, and communities to look at the role that cultural arts plays at the foundation of those communities. And I think that it's something that is easy to um, ignore or to minimize, but I think that almost all North Dakotans would admit that when, when, when you scratch the surface, cultural arts are really important and are part of even you know, everything from, from your church community, your faith community, um, your public service community, schools, and cultural arts is something that is stronger when the whole community supports it. And we're just really trying to promote that notion that a community is stronger with cultural arts and cultural arts are stronger with a community. We're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, real quick, how do you inspire others to tell their story and to put something in writing? I think as the Dunn County Writers, we offer a place for that to happen. So if anybody wants to come and tell their story, get it down in writing, and then we hope see it in print, come to our meetings. They're the first Monday of every month, 6 to 8 p.m. Mountain Time um, at the Dunn County Museum in Dunn Center. And finally, if people want more information about your event or the writers group, where can they go? Uh, they can go to poetryonthehighplains.eventbrite.com. Um, they can also call the Dunn County Writers phone number, which is 541-944-4131, and ask for me, I guess, Jennifer. Jennifer, yeah. thanks for joining us. We're out of time. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank Good you luck. very much. Good luck to you with your event. Well, maybe we'll see you. Thanks Stay for tuned coming. for more. Carl Zachman's interest in the Industrial Revolution began at an early age when he became fascinated by the workings of steam engines and stayed with him through his academic career, studying anthropology and archaeology. But it wasn't until he decided to postpone his Ph.D. studies to pursue an interest in art that it all came together.
I was a kid that was always interested in history museums, model railroads and trains, threshing shows. I actually ended up getting my steam license and I volunteer at different shows as I'm able and my schedule allows. The thing I love about stuff from the Industrial Revolution in general is that all of the moving parts are exposed. You can see how they work. It's just, it's a different world and a different time. The artwork I do is kind of a melding of all of my interests and passions for engineering, history, and art. My pieces, I guess, come to fruition in a couple different ways. Sometimes I start with a sketch or an idea in my head and I work towards the end goal with something specifically in mind. Other times I will just cut out gears of different patterns and colors and sizes and I start just rearranging things until I find something I like. It's more organic. Once that's done, I work out the technical details about, you know, levels and planes and what spins where and how things move and what direction things are going to spin. And then I start working on the panels, you know, what colors and textures, size, direction, things like that. I was always doing art. Growing up in a family with an artist, you know, I was always drawing, I was always playing, I was always sculpting. When I was younger, my father had a ceramic studio, so I got to play with the clay and mold it and watch the firing process and all that kind of stuff. I was interested in sculpture and ceramics. Um, I did some photography and things like that, but nothing was ever really set in stone as to what medium I would take. Just talking to my dad, you know, we were thinking about directions that I was going to try the art thing, but I really hadn't, you know, didn't have a, a, a solid concept. And we were talking about some of the steam shows and things like that and what my interests were. And my dad just, one of those comments, the little comments that's just off the cuff, says, you know, you can make art out of gears. And I just, like, that's it. I grabbed it. That's mine. I, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I, at arts festivals, I jokingly call my artwork engineer porn. In some of my artwork, I use gear patterns that have almost become extinct. Gears that are spiraled and nautilus shaped. Squares, ovals, triangles, all these odd shaped gears and mechanical motions. Those are the ones that really, really excite me and that I love to enjoy because they move so interestingly. All of the gears I make myself, they are based off of historic patterns. First, the curved spokes, I actually spent about a month of evenings going through archival sources, trying to find out the proportions and why they were shaped the way they were and how they were shaped, just so that when I recreated them, I would get the, the proper look. And I realized that there's also proper directions to run them. That The ones with the single curve, you want the forces to go down the curve so it brings it all to the metal. If you run them backwards, the forces will be more likely to, to shave off the spokes and break them. You know, I may make something that's four spokes into six spokes or alter things here and there, but the general look, the feel, I work very hard to keep it as vintage looking as possible. Art is something that, to me, you know, evokes thought and emotion and feeling. And, you know, that can be the gamut from shock to disgust to affection to love. I try to invoke, in a way, a sense of wonder and a sense of nostalgia. With a degree in anthropology and archaeology, it's not just about the artifacts. As an anthropologist, I like the people watching. I get to interact with people. I get to watch them look at my work and see their reactions. I get to watch people smile and, and you know, kids point and ask questions and get excited. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing. I've been doing this now for four to five years and it's been slowly evolving and changing and I'm not sure where it's going to go but 
it's a, it can be a slow process. Some pieces go a lot faster than others, but it's something that I, I do enjoy. You know, it is frustrating at times. You know, a car mechanic will scratch his head bald in a spot at a time staring at your car, but it's one of those things that when you're all done, there's that sense of satisfaction that you've created something that didn't exist before and that you brought something from your mind into the world for people to enjoy. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.